Yeah, we're live. 707. A little bit late. Was was uh, watching one of the games. I'm going to see if I can um, lighten this up a little bit here. There we go. I was watching one of the playoff games that I guess the 49ers were playing the Rams. And I was watching that with our family, but mostly I go there for the snacks. And if it's the Super Bowl, the snacks and the commercials are kind of what I go there for. But tonight we're talking about some cool stuff. I put a video up today and it is about turbo timing, not specifically turbo time, actually boosted timing because I, I did uh, different timing levels. I wanted to demonstrate what timing does on boosted applications. And I showed it on three different boosted 4.8 liter LS applications. So we ran one with a Vortex centrifugal supercharger. One of them with a Whipple supercharger, a positive displacement Whipple supercharger, and then the other one with a turbo, and then demonstrated what the different timing levels do. A lot of guys get confused about the tune. <laughs> they think that there's some magic that will make the thing not run, and and some magic that you know tuner knows what he's doing and and is going to put magic into it and and make the thing work better than is ever possible by anybody else in the world <laughs> that's that's not the reality and that's why i do these tests i'm not showing you how i tune or telling you that you should do it like i do it what i'm showing you is what happens when we do different timing levels on these combinations so you get to pick Sometimes you, I would run less just to be safer. Sometimes you can run more, and and if you're you know you got you need another a hundredth of a of a second in the quarter mile, or another mile, half a mile an hour, or a tenth of a mile an hour, whatever it is you need, and then you want to spice the tune up a little bit. Here's what happens when you do that. So here's what happens when you run. In this case, we ran on one of them. We ran timing down as low as 15 degrees, and ran them up as high as 23 or 24 degrees which is certainly possible at lower boost levels because you can, you know, if you're only, when, if you look at a typical um, timing map for when you transition from wide open throttle NA, like hundred KPA into boost, which is normally the 106 KPA or 112 KPA or something. Um, when you transition into that, it's, it's not like um, where you all of a sudden it's under boost and you just take all the timing away. So I go from, if we were to run the, a, a typical LS motor, 29 degrees of NA timing at the power peak anyway. And then when, when we go into boost, if we go into two or two pounds or something like that, three pounds, um, we don't go into all of a sudden, we don't jump down to 20 degrees of timing or 18 or 15. Um, you might only jump down a couple uh, at that boost level and, and, and transition through that. And that will help you with those kinds of things, that part of the tune part of it, that which good tuners can do. Uh, I am not one of those people. I can make the thing run wide open throttle without any problem. Transition stuff is very important. Transition timing is very important for things like um, boost response, especially boost response actually out on the, out on the road or out, out on the track or even on the chassis dyno. Because as you roll in from very little throttle angle to lots of throttle angle, as you're doing that, you're transitioning uh, in the map from one position, from an NA position with light or no throttle into a boosted position. And ultimately, you're going to get to a wide open throttle position if you're making a run on the chassis dyno or you're trying to go wide open throttle and go fast on the street or the track, whatever you're doing, you're racing with somebody. But you will transition through there. And as you transition through there, if you see, okay, I've got 29 degrees of timing, then boom, all of a sudden I've got 20. It doesn't need to do that. It, it could go, you know, 29, 27, 25, 24, whatever. And then you, you want it to be safe, but you also want it to be um, a smooth transition and an, and an effective transition transition. I didn't show that in this video. I just was thinking about it as I was talking about it, but I showed what happens with running things at different timing levels. So we ran it at, we ran one of them as low as 15. And then we ran one of them as high as, like I said, 23 or 24. And we usually went up in two degree increments to show you what happens. Okay. Here's what happens when we go from 18 to 20 to 22 to 24. And you can see that normally you would get on most boosted applications, you would start getting diminishing returns. You certainly get that on NA stuff. You go from 
20, 20 degrees on, you know, on an NA motor to 22 or 24, 26, and you, and you keep adding power. But as you get closer to where the thing doesn't want any more timing, you'll just start not getting gains. And the, uh, a lot of times it happens on um, boosted applications, specifically turbo applications. But sometimes with these boosted ones, we've run motors where you keep gaining power when you're adding timing right up to the point where you don't have any more pistons left. And so you got to be careful with that. You can't just go by, oh, look, I've gained power. I've gained power. I've gained power. Oh, look, I don't have any motor anymore. So you definitely don't want to do that, which is why, and I mentioned this in the video, that we stopped at 23 or 24 degrees. 24 degrees was okay at low boost on the 85 with an intercooler and all that. Um, normally, that that gets up there in the pretty spicy zone. <laughs> so we don't do that. But what I want to show is people that like, if you're talking to a tuner and tuner says, oh yeah, I, you know, I put the tune on it and, and did really good. Well, you can ask them, well, what did you do? Did you, what timing is it at at wide open throttle under boost? What, what are you doing? What is it at 3000? What is it at 6,500 or 7,000? And you can kind of figure that out because you can look at these graphs and go, hey, look, Richard ran this much timing and here's how much power it gained. Well, it might be that I'm, I err on the safe side and I don't care about going from 22 degrees to 24 degrees or even 20 to 22. And the other thing I didn't show on this is that I, I was showing you what happens with these timing uh, changes in, in kind of an optimized condition because we're running it on the engine dyno. We have cold air, we have cold water in the motor, we have plenty of fuel, we have plenty of octane, all that. So we can juggle the timing around kind of as much as we want. Obviously, I wouldn't put 30 or 40 degrees in here under boost because then we, we definitely heard it. But in that range, we have plenty of safety margin. You might not have that on the street because your engine coolant temperature is going to be hotter. More than likely, your air temperature is going to be hotter because, you, and especially for the guys that insist on grabbing air from behind a radiator and sealed engine compartment into the turbo or into their blower and not grabbing cold air, at least ambient air from outside the engine compartment. Because you can see a difference, of, you might see a difference of 100 degrees going from a cold air source to an, an air source under the hood. It, it can be that hot under the hood. It can be a lot. So I don't recommend that. And it's a big change in power. And also, even if it, if you don't see the big change in power, trust me, you will. But if you don't see a big change in power, you will definitely see um, stepping up much closer to the to the danger zone, to the de to the detonation level, the higher the charge temperature gets. And 100 degrees is a lot. I mean, that's a difference between having an intercooler or not having an intercooler. So you don't want to do that. So cold air is always good. So where I'm able to do this testing on the dyno to show, to just to give you guys an idea on, you know, because if somebody tells you, oh yeah, you'll, you know, if you go from 20 to 22 degrees, you'll pick up 50 horsepower. <laughs> Pro probably not. <laughs> you might get 50 horsepower going from 15 degrees to 22 degrees that might have that kind of change but not two degrees is not usually that much and then the the more power that you're talking about like if you're talking about a thousand horsepower motor the amount that you could pick up probably would change also so if you're talking about a thousand horsepower motor and you're and you're changing timing more than likely you're going to get you're going to get bigger changes because it's going to work kind of as a percentage i think so this was a good illustration on what happens and i did i have another video up that I reference all the time because like whenever we talk about tuning, I, I get this all the time that, oh yeah, I, you know, cause I, I'll get, I'll get guys that do this. They'll ask a question in the comment because they're trying to steer me. And this is how they think that they're controlling the situation. Well, what air fuel did you run? That's not the question that they want to ask. That's not even the answer that they want. What they want to do is set it up so that they can say something negative. So if I tell them, oh, I ran 12.8, Almost no matter what on an NA motor, almost no matter what what number I give them, they're then going to say, oh, there's a lot left in the tune then. You should have went to 13.1. Or if I was running it at 11.5 on a turbo motor and, oh, you should have run it at 11.8 or 11.0 or whatever whatever number that they like that's the, you know, got is the optimum number that, that that is better than anybody else's number. Little do they know, obviously they weren't present at any of the dyno testing and don't know how receptive the thing is to changes in air fuel. Um, and it might be that that going, you know, a lot of times we'll run, I'll run sweeps on the air fuel on an NA motor. We'll go from 11 and a half to 13. And, and you see a handful of horsepower because it just doesn't care. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you'd use a lot more fuel if you're running it at 11 and a half or 11, eight instead of 12, eight, like you should be, <laughs> but it doesn't change the power very much. And, and in the one video that I have up, it was a test that I did with uh, Freiburger and Dulcich when we did a, 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 one of the engine masters episodes. And we put, we went from, you know, 12, eight or 13 to one down to nine to one. And as a matter of fact, I think it was also, it was, it, it was in the eights as well at some part in the curve because we took the like 70 jets out and this was a carbureted small block too, not just, not a fuel injected motor. This is a carbureted small block, <laughs> excuse me. So that um, we ran, I think we ran jets that were in the 70 range and we put hundreds or whatever the biggest jet that we had in there. Cause we want to throw the kitchen sink at it and it still ran and it, it swept all the way through and ran and it did lose power going from 12 and a half or 12, eight down to 8.8 or nine Oh, or whatever the number was. It did lose a little bit of power, but not nearly as much as you would think, not nearly as much as tuners will have you think that it loses because it's not, it's, it was not misfiring. And so it was still running. It was just running rich and not making as much power. In that same in that same show on the same test on that same motor, we changed the timing. So we changed the timing from where it needed to be. I'm, I'm going to say 35 degrees on on the carbureted small block, and then I think we went all the way down to I don't know 10 or something, and it lost a lot of power. It lost 100 or 150 horsepower, not having the timing in it that it needed. So it shows it goes to show you that of the two things, air fuel makes much less of a difference. And it's the same way on turbo and supercharged combinations. Air fuel makes much less of a difference. Timing can make a big difference, especially if you're on the timing, if you're way off on the timing, which you see this. And this is a, one of the reasons that when guys run these things on pump gas, they have to take all the timing out of it because you have to get the thing away from the detonation zone. So they take all the timing out of it and get it away from the de detonation zone, which is good. So your motor lives and, you know, it's still making decent turbo power. The problem is that the power is way, way down from where it could be because it doesn't have the timing in it that it needs, even on pump gas. And, and I get this all the time. Well, pump gas, you know, needs more timing than race gas. No, if you have, if I run a naturally aspirated motor and it wants to run at 29 degrees and I put a hundred octane in, in it, it's going to want to run at 29 degrees. And it's going to make the it's in in the testing that I've done, unless the fuel we have is somehow oxygenated, which you some of the hundreds that we do are like that, it makes the same power. The the difference in power is minimal, and also the difference in the timing needs. A lot of people think for some reason, they think that, and this I'm we're going off on a tangent here, but a lot of people think that race gas <laughs> has a different burn rate than pump gas does, like hundred octane burns a lot slower than 91 and then 91 burns a lot slower than 87. The burn rate and the octane rating are mutually exclusive. They're two different things. There, there may be a correlation, but it's not a causal effect. 87 doesn't have to burn faster than 91. The burn rate can be the same. It can be different. It can be different one way or could, could be different the other way. That's not the same thing. The octane rating is a different kind of test. And a lot of guys don't understand that. They just, oh, yeah, you put 100 in it. You need to add more timing. No, we put 100 in it, and we could add more timing, especially on a turbo motor, because now it's safer. But on an NA motor, like on a 10 to 1 NA small block or a LS or whatever it is, if we go from 91, which on our, when we run them cold and run them in the engine dyno, we can put all of the timing in it. It doesn't want any more timing. It doesn't respond to going to more timing. When we put 100 octane in it, in it, it doesn't respond to any more timing. We can run more if we wanted, and we certainly would on a boosted application. But it it didn't it doesn't make any more power when we do that. So that's some interesting things, and you guys can take a look at again on the on the timing thing. The timing thing is just showing you guys what happens when you change the timing. Here's what the power gain is. And if you want that, that's fine. And I mentioned in the video that if you're trying to get to more power, obviously timing is one way, but as we go up and up, we, we go into much closer to the danger zone. So you guys get to decide how, how far you want to push it. And a lot of times racers will push it all the way and, and then end up, you know, burning a valve or hurting a plug. Or if you, if you, 
if you only heard a spark plug, that's okay. It would be nice if spark plugs were the weak link on that and they would and it would just burn the electrode out before it burned the piston out. But a lot of times when you take the plug out and go, oh yeah, there's no more ground strap on this. And then you go, oh yeah, there's like piston particles on that. That's that's not good. So that's what happened. So hopefully you guys are doing good. Hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, we had uh, we got to take the dogs for a walk today and uh, my lovely wife, Lisa, <laughs> um has her water bottle that she brought with us and we were hiking all over the hills and hiking up and down and getting a good workout in and we we decided to climb up one more hill and got to the top of that hill and she realized she was going to take a drink of water and realized that she had left her water bottle on the other hill <laughs> when, when she sat down we were sitting down on the rocks um because i was looking for snakes like always and so we had to go back down and then back up the hill. The dogs are looking at us like, I'm never coming on a walk with you guys again. This is ridiculous. So that, that was fun. So let's see what you guys got going on. Uh, stock bottom end, 5385. Uh, max timing on 20 pounds. Mm, on, on 20 pounds on E85, we might be at 18 or 20 degrees. What's your favorite octane booster? I don't really have one. I, I haven't found octane booster working very well. A lot of times we throw a can of octane booster in, in NA motors. Um, just maybe, maybe it was 10 and a half or 11 to one compression. And we think that it would help it a little bit just so that to, as a hedge against possible detonation. Um, but I've never tried any of the ones that are supposed to work. Almost all of the store-bought stuff is not going to change the octane rating very much. Travis, I start to build, I start going to full timing at 3,200 on an NA tune. Do you ramp the timing longer on boosted engines? We do. We would have more, much more of a ramp in it because we would want the, you're most likely on a boosted application to cause detonation at the highest cylinder pressure point, which is going to be at the torque peak. So we almost always have less timing at the torque peak than we do at the horsepower peak. And the other reason for that, obviously, is that as we go up in engine speed, you need the timing to happen a little bit earlier so that the expansion happens at the right time. And that's just RPM related. That's a that's a relationship between RPM and the time that it takes for the expansion to happen. So even on boosted applications, they we normally obviously run less timing on the boosted applications. But at higher RPM, you're going to want more timing and you're going to want less at at, and then at, at a really low engine speed, even below the torque peak, we have even less timing. I like to run two gallons, Vern, I like to run two gallons of 100 octane to my 14 gallons of 91. Yeah, that's good. In your 9.6 to 1 small block board. Interesting. Five gallons of 110 and five gallons of 93. That would be a good combination. You could get a lot, you could get a lot of... I'll zing out of that. Add xylene straight to gas or octane booster. Richard, can you show us the boost charts on the timing video? I want to see if more timing resulted in less boost on the boost engine. I'll take a look and see. I don't, I honestly don't remember. I don't think it did. Any tips on gasoline that's already been sitting for about three months? If it's been sitting in a sealed container, it's probably okay. Um, if it's been open, that's not good. If it's in a sealed container and it doesn't have a lot of air above where, wherever the level of the fuel is, uh, it's probably okay and I would use it. I would use it anyway. I would just go put it in my truck, which doesn't, I mean, you could put 87 in it, so I wouldn't care. Have you ever had an engine that you didn't like? Yes, I've had some that I didn't like because they didn't cooperate on the engine. I know the way that I wanted them to. So on the engine dyno, there isn't any gains running higher octane, but I see gains on the chassis dyno. I, I don't know how you could. Could it be that how cold you're able to run the motors on the engine dyno? Yes, where, where you could possibly see gains from higher octane is if you're running the engine closed loop, let's say, where it will pull timing, where it will sense detonation with knock sensors and pull timing. And then when it doesn't sense that, it will add timing. We don't have that happen on the engine dyno because I control that. So if you're having that happen in the car and it's pulling timing and that would hurt power 
And then if you put octane in it and it's not doing that, it's not pulling timing, then it will add power. And that happens a lot. A lot of guys, um, when they run E85 on Coyote motors, it's a good example too. The Coyote has charge cooling as well, but also has higher octane. Those things run essentially on the knock sensors all the time. So they're trying to max out the performance of the car based on the knock sensor, and then they'll pull a little bit away, pull a little bit away. But when you put E85 in there, they don't have to pull it away because there's more than enough, more than enough octane. Nick, is it crazy to run a 6.0 with a GT45 on California 91? Um, no, you can run, I've run boosted stuff on 91 before. It's just that you're going to have to take the timing out of it. And I don't know, I can't give you a recommendation on timing. You're just going to have to find out on the chassis dyno or on the street. Typically, I know Matt recommends on 91. His thing is like you can run 14 pounds of boost on 14 degrees of timing is a good, like, rough idea. When you're porting LS heads and remove the rocker bolt bump, is there an issue with leaks when under boost? N no, because the bolt's going to be there. Uh, Richard, in Australia, we often do static load testing at various RPM sites and adjust timing and software to find MBT. Do you ever do this? No, what we do is we... You can, we can do static loads too, and we can do them at all RPMs. In fact, when I start the tuning process, when it's a brand new motor and, and whatever size injectors we decide to run on it, what we'll do is we'll take the timing out of it so in an air, at, at an area that we know is safe. So we'll make it like, for instance, if we have an NA motor, we'll put 20 degrees in it. And then we'll start doing static uh, loads at so let's say 3000 RPM. We'll do our first one at 3000 RPM. We'll just roll into it. And as we're rolling into it, if I'm doing it, I'll do it or Ish or Eric, they'll just start, you know, adding or adjusting the fuel so that they can go, okay, at 3000 RPM at wide open throttle. And as the transition to that, we have a, we now have a safe air fuel. And then we'll try another one at 3500 and we now have a safe air fuel. And then we, we don't have to do that all the way through the RPM range because once we have that, we're never going to go as a transition spot through 4,000 or 5,000 or 6,000 or whatever the number is. So now, now we have our ramp to get to full throttle. Okay, once we do that and we know the air fuel safe, then we can start adding timing. And we add timing until we know that it, until it doesn't make any more power. The dyno will tell us when we've reached the maximum torque output and the maximum horsepower output of whatever the timing is going to do. And then we obviously, especially on an NA motor, then we just don't go anymore. We might go past it just one degree or something. Like <clears throat> if I go from 29 to 30, we don't see anything. When I went from 28 to 29, we saw very little. And, and we know from having done it, I don't know, 5,000 times, that when we, when we start seeing, we see a big change in power going from one timing level to another, we start a little bit less on the next one and then, and then a little bit less and then very, very little. We know that the next one's going to be nothing. And so we'll, we might go there just to make sure that a lot of times we're not, I'm not looking for that last one or two usually, unless I like when I was doing engine masters, I definitely was. But in this case, we don't do that. But when we run it, I, I add timing. And then if it makes more power, I keep adding timing. If it doesn't add anymore, and this is anywhere in the curve. So if I start out at 15 degrees, and I go at 3000 RPM and I go up to finally get up to 20 degrees and I go to 21 degrees there and it doesn't add any more power. Then the timing there at 3000 RPM stays at 20. And then I'll go and then for each RPM, we'll, it will create its own curve, basically its own timing curve because it wants less timing down low than it wants at the top. Uh, brother, I run 10 and a half to one, I'm assuming on my two JZ with Octanium at 14 PSI, no issues, 12 to 14 degrees, the street engine are, and are you running, what are you running that on? Are you running pump gas and some sort of octane boost and 12 to 14 degrees isn't very much timing. Is there a max timing difference, heat transfer difference, et cetera, between iron LS and alloy LS? Are you talking about the blocks? For the blocks, I don't think so. 
Um, the motors that we've run, whether we're running an iron block, 4853, 6 liter, whatever, or an aluminum LS1, LS2, LS3, L33, whatever it is, they all seem to kind of want the same timing in the testing that I've done around 29 or 30 degrees for, for, uh, and, and, and this is going to be a function way more of the cylinder head design and the chamber size than it is going to be for, um, a difference between aluminum and iron. An aluminum and iron head might have more of a difference than the block will. On pump 91, 93 on the dyno, what timing would you run on a turbo LS? I don't do a lot of pump gas timing stuff, like I said, but Matt, when, when Matt does it at sloppy, he does a lot of chassis dyno tuning, which would give you a better idea than the engine dyno would, because we have much more of an optimized condition, but in the car with it running with the trans and the tire size and all that stuff. Um, I, like I said, I think he has told me that he can do 14 degrees of timing and 14 pounds of boost. And so that should kind of give you an idea. Four white stroke or Scott, thank you very much. Oh, let me drop on. Nice. Definitely gonna have to tell Lisa about that. 408 stroke or ported build 241, Summit 8720 cam, 218, 227, Holly Sniper. Oh, the cross ram, 93 octane. I want a bit of a lag to maintain traction. What size turbos? What um what power output are you wanting to do? If you're 93 octane, that's not gonna make you're not gonna have be able to make a lot of power with it anyway. Um I think you could do two GT45s on a 408. Is there a kit I can buy to run the belt around my electric water pump for my truck? So you have, do you have a Mazir electric water pump? I thought that Mazir had a, if it's a Mazir, I thought that they had an electric water pump that also has an idler so that you could run a belt. It's just spinning the idler and the electric water pump is doing the work. Uh, Richard, have you used race fuel concentrate? I have not. One gallon of xylene to three gallons of 93 octane and 20 ounces of mar. You're going to put marble mystery oil in there? I wonder what the flash point of marble mystery oil is. 93 octane with octanium is approximately 100 to 102. 10, you're getting seven or seven to nine points change. It seems like a lot. Do you have a favorite basic turbo kit for an LQ4? I don't usually test kits, I just test turbo sizes. Um, so you just have to pick whatever power output you want. A GT45 works okay on a six liter, it's a little small on the on the hot side, I think. Um, and it's about a 700 or 750 horsepower turbo, then, then you could go something bigger than that. If you're wanting to do, you know, eight or 900 or even a thousand. Can ignition timing be advanced or retarded through an entire curve or just set the advance point RPM and leave it alone. The, on a standalone fuel management system, you can put the, um, curve, you can put the advance wherever you want. You can make the ignition or the timing, anything that you want at any combination of load and RPM. And we can also, if we create a curve, we could retard the whole thing by two degrees or four degrees or advance it by two or four degrees if we wanted to do that. Can you run any more timing at high altitude? Yes. Uh, with pump gas versus low altitude. Yeah, I, I think guys run more timing at, like in Denver or Albuquerque. Uh, I commented on your video today on the turbo versus Whipple versus centrifugal. It, it wasn't turbo versus Whipple versus centrifugal because they run on different combinations. It was more about the timing for each one of them. Um, I don't know what a Plex V2 knock module is. We ran these with a Holly HP management system. 
If you're not using knock sensors, how are you monitoring detonation on the engine dyno? Can you hear it pinging in the control room? You could if you let it get into detonation. And I've listened through um, the old school copper tubing method where you bolt that to the head and it works. <laughs> but I don't, we don't normally let it do that. And I, and I don't care about running the motor until we get detonation, which is why we stop where the timing levels that we stopped at. There was no knock at the levels that we tested this at. Uh, do you feel when you found optimal timing for a set boost level and you see X timing boost to timing ratio or retarding of the timing stay the same amount of ratio regardless of how much the boost is added? Uh, are you asking if we, I think it sounds like you're asking if we retard the timing as we go up and boost and the answer is yes. It wants less timing and it will, um, uh, it wants less timing. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something else, but I can't. And it will tolerate less timing. I have not tested, the question is, have you ever tested the 8.1 Vortec, the 496 Gen 7 big block? And I haven't run one on the dyno yet. Does high octane raise hydrocarbons? Why did 100 octane go away from the pump years ago? Why limit to 87 to 91? Go used to be reddish purple. I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. I don't know if the, I don't think that they lost the high octane fuel because of emissions. Uh, when are you going to throw all the beans to a root supercharged big block? Well, I don't understand. I built lots of big blocks and tested them already to the limit of those superchargers. They're not, unless you ran a, unless you run a really big one, they're not, they don't make very much power. Uh, happy. I've heard you pull roughly two degrees of timing for every 50, 50 horsepower shot of nitrous. How accurate is this? It, it is the recommendation that you see from all of the nitrous suppliers. It says four degrees per hundred horsepower. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good and it's pretty safe. Sometimes on the first 100 shot or 75 shot or 50 shot, we don't pull any timing. And I've done that a lot. And if you have enough, especially if you have enough octane and like we're running it cold and all that stuff, um, it doesn't doesn't hurt it. Yeah. A, oh, a GT35 on a 5.3, a single GT35. Wow. <coughs> I mean, that's a, <coughs> that's like a five or 600 horsepower turbo. Uh, how much for a GT45 turbo kit? I don't know. The turbo itself, we, we buy them for two to $300, I think. Excuse me. That's just for the turbo. Oh, Uh, do you drop a degree to be safe after peak performance run? We, I would do that to go out on the street. I, I, as a matter of fact, I'd probably take more than that away. When, when it goes from the engine dyno to the chassis dyno, the timing values are certainly going to be lower. And the, and really for, you know, to a larger extent, the, the tune is going to be quite a bit different. You can't run a motor on the engine dyno and tune it. Certainly not the way that I do it. Cause I'm only doing wide open throttle and then have it go run on the street. I mean, it'll start up and stuff, but it's not its not anywhere near right. Um, even if I were to let the thing, if I were to go in and let it run a closed loop and drive the thing around under closed loop and have it um, and, and put in all of the areas that I want, you know, put in my desired air fuel ratios for the different load points and RPMs and put all that in and do all of that work and, and have a nice smooth, you know, curve that's all interpolated and it looks all pretty. So all of the other tuner guys would say, oh, yeah, that's a nice looking curve. Um, even if I did that and we, and you ran it and if you wouldn't plug that in, it wouldn't be right for the car at the at the drag strip or on the chassis dyno or anything. It's just the engine dyno is not for that. The engine dyno is more for finding out that the motor 
works and has eight holes and, and makes the power that you want it to do and all that stuff. And then then that kind of tuning would be done on the chassis diner on the street. Uh, how would you cut spark when running water meth as a fail safe in the stock computer? <clears throat> I don't know how you do that in the stock computer. Some computers will take a signal from, because I think that Snow had their stuff set up so that it could send a signal um, to the computer to then you would have to program timing retard into it when the water meth was not working. Um, when the Because they have sensors on it that show when the bottle gets too low or empty or whatever. And when it's, when it's not, when it's not injecting, you can have that fail safe, but I don't know about a factory computer. Yeah. Two stroke is definitely going to reduce the octane. If you have oil in there, the flash point of oil is going to be not good. Have I ever tried mixing E85 and 93? I've, I've heard some people like it as an option. Uh, you might be able to do that. I know some of the E85 that I've run, like we've run race E85 from the guys at um, uh, Rocket. And I think also, um, uh, who are the guys that make C16? Um, when they make E85, they, they blend it with a higher octane than, than what the pump stuff is. So they have a they have higher octane part gasoline part of the mixture, um, and then their E85 is also better because it's going to be at least E85, and sometimes it's a, even a little bit more than that. So you can get away with more if you're trying to go for that every last little bit of of timing and boost and all that, trying to maximize your combination. You can get away with more and probably make more with race E85 than you can with pump E85. The stuff that I'm doing with a junkyard turbo deal the Pump 85 is more than fine. Uh, what did you think of adapting an LS intake to a Windsor using 3D printed adapters? I'd like to hear your thoughts from experience. I I need to look at it and see how well it lined up. We looked at 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 running a fast intake manifold, which would be the one that I like a fast LS manifold on a Ford. And we wanted to see if it looked like it was possible. Um, it's going to be quite a bit of work. But I would be interested in that. I just would need to, need to take a closer look and see how closely the ports line up and see how bad the um, adapters would have to be. Because in a lot of cases, when we've run adapters to things, for instance, when we've run LS3 intake manifolds on cathedral port heads or the, or the reverse is also true, the adapters that are required to make that happen just kill power. And it's just not a good choice. The same thing when I did the five liter Windsor 302, 289 based intake manifolds and ran those on the modular Ford using adapters from the guys from Carcraft. Same thing. It looks really cool. And it's a great idea because then now their intake choices are like infinite. The problem is that because of the mismatch in the adapters, the things just don't really make power. Uh, would it be worth advancing time with colder spark plugs? No, that's not that's not going to change anything. Uh, let's say on an ignition curve, I advance it to X number and I turn it up two degrees at 4,800 and it pings at only 5,100, so I pull it back one degree and go one degree forward again at 5,600. You, you can do that, and that's exactly what I was talking about when we do these curves, is we're, we're not doing it based on detonation. We're doing it based on power, but that's what we do. We run the thing at whatever timing level it wants to be at, and then we don't go any higher than than it not making power anymore. If, it doesn't, if, it, if we go up in timing, it doesn't gain any power, we go back to the lower number. So whatever the number is where it made the most power and then showed no gain after that, that's where that number is. Whatever RPM level that is, on my stuff is all wide open throttle testing. So at wide open throttle, the timing number might be 23 down at 3000 RPM. And it might be 29 at 
6,500 is back. It might be 29 from 5,000 out to 6,900, depending on where the torque peak is. <laughs> 60 degrees advanced too much for, for nitro. I don't know. Does it, is it working? It depends on your boost level, Dan. Can ignition curves be tuned to the 10th or 100th RPM? I, I don't know what you mean. You, you want the timing to be different at 5,410 RPM than it is at 5,400 RPM? I don't do that. It, you, you might be able to scale your map so that you have that sort of re resolution, although that'd be a lot of cells. <laughs> um, and I don't know why you would want to. Uh, how does cylinder head design change time requirements? Quite a bit because the different cylinder heads uh, and not just size, but also shape are going to be, are going to want and work best with um, a given amount of timing. A good example is a big block Chevy head. You run a big block Chevy head, especially on a flat top piston. <laughs> it's terrible. It's really low, low compression, but not because of the low compression, the chamber design itself um, doesn't want, it's going to run like we've run 40 degrees of timing on some of those things because they're just not that efficient. Uh, a good, a better example might be for the LS guys here is a 317 head versus a 799 head or a 706 head. The 317 head always seems to want a degree or two more timing. Um, it, it's going to have lower compression, but also it's not a great chamber shape. It's not a good chamber design. Um, in fact, the, the most common question is if I mill my 317, so it equals the chamber size of a 799 or 243, will it make the same power? And according to Brian Tooley, no, it won't, because he's he said that he's tested that and that that chamber design, and you, you look at them, it's dramatically different. The chamber design is not great on the 317 head. In addition to being bigger and lower compression, it's also not a good design. Uh, and the, your question also was um, modular Ford versus LS or Hemi. The other thing about a modular Ford, especially a four valve, is it's a centrally located spark plug. So it doesn't have to go from one side of the chamber to the other. It goes, has to go from the center and out, which requires less timing for that to happen. It's a four valve design. It's much more efficient. If it is a four valve, two valve probably wants more timing than the four valve does. Uh, how much time do you pull for each pound of boost? I, I honestly never do it that way. There's no 2.2 liter news. G'day, mate. Australia, awesome. Love the channel. Support from Victor Harbor, South Australia. That's awesome, dude. Welcome, Chris. For seven bucks a gallon, you can get 100 octane at your airport, and it will stay fresh for a couple of years, unlike the crap that we get at the pump. Is the, is the 100 octane stuff at the airport still that leaded aviation fuel? Have you experimented with fuels? I haven't experimented so that your thing about tetraethyl lead, I, I haven't experimented with fuels a lot other than running the pump stuff or the race gas stuff that we have, but not specifically putting additives or anything in them. Getting a lot of knowledge with today's videos. Great. I appreciate it. Is it worth it to richen the mixer to help suppress detonation? Sometimes. Sometimes that doesn't help. If you have a detonation problem that's timing related, you're probably not going to be able to cure it with, with fuel. If I had the opportunity to work with anyone, who would it be? I, I don't know. Um, I, the, the thing that I'd like to do is I want to do something with Rob on a, um, Rob Dom over, uh, he does all the rotary stuff. I'd like to do some rotary stuff with him. Cause I don't, I've done some rotary stuff on the chassis dyno, but I want to run one on the engine dyno. So I would, I would really like to do, do a deal with him. Is a TBS intake, a truck spec intake. And is it good for a four, eight, uh, trailblazer S is, is an enhanced version a performance version of the factory truck intake manifold it is better although i honestly don't know i i want to test those two 
down at 2000 RPM to see if one of those is better than the other one. The Trailblazer SS is definitely better on the top end than the um, regular truck is. The 4.8 would be, of all of the applications that I would put it on, the 4.8 would be the last one because it will gain the less unless you're running lots of camshaft and cylinder head on it. What's better for a 5.3 with a Summit 80, 8715 R1 cam, 799 heads with trick flow, 600 valve lifts, a single or twin turbo? Either one of those will do whatever you want. You just size the turbo for whatever power you want, and you could do it with two of them, or you could do it with a, a bigger single one. Have you done anything with the advisor? Yes. Right now, he is actually porting a 2.2 liter turbo Chrysler head for me. And he's already put it up in one video where he did a port mold of it. And you can see why that head is so bad. Um, I haven't talked to him for, uh, it's pro probably been a couple of weeks now. I need to give him a call and find out if they've done any baseline um, airflow testing with it. Uh, we're going to see the Nova. Somebody asked when we're going to see the Nova again. Um, the I'm going to do some stuff on the Nova when it when the weather gets a little bit warmer. I'm going to take it down to West Tech. Uh, knock sensors, types, brands, what's your preference? I don't really have one. I don't actually ever use knock sensors on anything. We don't use them on the engine dyno. I know I do need to have the GLH running. I, I don't even know if the, I need to call and, and we'll do this on Monday. I need to find out if the, from the machine shop, if the 2.2 is ready to go back together so we can run it on the engine dyno. Richard, have you seen the Ardema guys? Yeah, I've met Pete many times um, with their scratch built engines for the salt flat cars. Uh, they have some really cool stuff. They do. Uh, and Pete's been over to West Deck quite a few times. So I've seen a lot of his stuff. What progressive nitri nitrous controller would you recommend? I honestly don't even remember testing one of those on the engine dyno. I don't remember doing that. Uh, Sherman, thanks for reading the comment. What I meant to say was a nice 871 with big dominators. 15% overdrive on the 85. <clears throat> Um, I ran an 871 on, what do we run it on? I think a 496. And I think that it was in the, in the I want to say it was in the 1,000 to 1,100 horsepower range. Um, the guys that are spinning those really fast are really kind of spinning their wheels. I mean, I know that ultimately if you're, if you're making, because you have a big block and you're making, let's say it's 700 divided by 14.7. So let's say you have something that's making 45 or 50 horsepower per pound of boost. And so you do that because you have a 700 horsepower NA motor on a big block and you put a 1471 on it. You're not going to get that kind of gain because they just don't do that. There's a lot of parasitic loss associated with driving that blower. But let's say that you're getting 30 or 40 horsepower per pound and you're going up and then you get to the point where you're getting 20 and then 15 and then you're only getting 10. And then sometimes you're only getting five horsepower for each pound of boost that you turned up because you're getting a lot more heat. You have to do a lot of stuff to those blowers to make them work. You have to do, they have to strip the blower. You know, the guys from the blower shops have really good ones. They build cases and you can strip the blowers. And then you can run them like Freiburger did, ran one on the motor that he has. They made 1500 with that one, but that was with nitrous. That was with nitrous and E85. And they also had a tunnel ram on it because they ran that blower on a tunnel ram. It was a stripped race blower, 871. Um, and, and they threw, uh, like I said, they had two E85 carburetors and then they had, uh, nitrous, um, uh, that they're running on it too. And it, it made really good power. Uh, I want to LS up a project that I'm doing. What engine is good? Uh, the ones you're going to find in the wrecking yards most often, 4.8 and 5.3. You might find a 5.0 if you want. 
and you want to make around 400 to 550. That's a really, really big range. <laughs> you need to be a little more specific. 400 horsepower is a 4.8 with a cam in it or a 5.3 with a cam in it, a really small cam. Um, or a stock 6.0 is 400. 550 is a pretty well done six liter. Yes, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. Am I? Am I, I must be way, way down here. <clears throat> yeah, if you're going to run knock sensors on the factory stuff, definitely stick with factory knock sensors. <clears throat> They're already tuned for that combination. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when the weather gets warmer, you're in Alaska. I know it's, yeah, we have no room to talk. <laughs> if you could work on a Honda H22 with anybody in the world with Celica in his name, who would you choose? <laughs> that Mike Celica guy, he's really cool. I like him. He's, he does good stuff. Do you consider yourself insane? Yes. When converting a carb intake to port injection, do you use a four hole throttle body or a mono, mono throttle body? It doesn't matter. I've run that test and we ran a, a 4150 style throttle body and then we put the elbow with a big open 102 millimeter throttle body that made the same power. Uh, Evan made a comment about retarding timing and, and causing higher EGTs. That's a good point. And that's one thing I didn't talk about in the video is that uh, the other thing that happens is when you run and, and you can see this on running any turbo motor on the engine dyno, especially if the lights off, <laughs> because you have retarded the timing quite a bit on a turbo application relative to an NA application, you'll see the exhaust manifolds for the turbo or, or any associated tubing will just glow red hot. <laughs> Uh, what size turbo would you recommend for an L32 swap and a V6 Camaro for daily driver? Probably a GT35. How much timing is too much timing for a stock 5.3 on 87 pump gas cruising and wide open throttle? For, <clears throat> for cruising, I, there's probably no amount of timing that would cause a problem at cruise. You'd be surprised how much timing is in that thing when you're when you're at a light throttle cruise. Um, wide open throttle on 87 is going to be pretty low. I don't know what that is because I don't I don't read the timing while I'm driving my truck. <laughs> yep, Mike Solica. Is any relation, Tom? Do you know him? Could you hook that up? Uh, any experience with a 250 low blower? I'm going to run on a 454. I have run a 250 mega blower. If that's what it's if that's what you're talking about. Ooh, I prepped a championship winning Eclipse Turbo. Nice. Keep up the good videos. You do a lot of testing. Yes, there's there's has been a lot of testing. <laughs> Oh, I skipped down. I did miss questions. I missed a lot of questions because I had to skip down. I'll go back here just a little bit and see. I enjoy the rule of thumb type talks like the horsepower estimates. Yep. I just chose the name because I have an all track. 
I do like people with all tracks because I do like all tracks. How much is an aluminum head iron block LS weigh? I don't know. So what, is, what does somebody think? 450 or 500 pounds or something? <laughs> do you ever spend 20 minutes looking for a tool you just had all, all the time? Uh, can turbo fuel injection have quick throttle response like a carb? Uh, yes. Uh, Dan, did you catch the end of the Rolex race? No, but I, uh, I, I called Brian Tooley earlier today and we needed to get on a phone call and he said, okay, I'm watching the last 15 minutes of the 24 hours. I said, okay, that's cool. But I did not watch any of it. The one and two Porsche spun each other out on the last lap. Nice. And a Ferrari won their class. Uh-oh. 24 hours, it came down to two knuckleheads hitting each other. That happens, man. The guys are going for it. That's what I told Brian. I said, you need to watch like the first half hour or something. I said, because people, you know, because you can win the 24-hour race in the first lap. And so guys will crash then. I said, and then watch the last half hour, 20 minutes or whatever that he watched. I said, because that's then they're going to be jockeying for position and stuff. For a lot of them, you look at them, you're like, man, that used to be a really nice looking car. Now it looks like it's just limping around. Like it's been in 17 different like bar fights. <laughs> and it's just hobbling around. Just, oh, please let this thing be over. <laughs> but the amazing thing is I, I can't believe that like at the top level of stuff, how fast those cars go for how long they go fast for. They're just going. They're just, they're like going as fast as they can for as long as they can. And it's, it's really amazing stuff. So the iron block is a hundred pounds heavier roughly than the aluminum block. On dyno testing and timing on a chassis dyno, have you ever gotten somewhere you like but backed off the timing for longevity on the street use? Yeah, I will do that a lot. Like we did that on the Bonneville car. The Bonneville car, we ran it on the chassis dyno and I tuned it with what I thought were really good combinations of um boost level that we would potentially run we always run it i always run tested at higher boost levels than we will probably run when i was doing bonneville in the civic because if we did that if we turned it up that high i you know as you it's like anything with the timing or the boost when you go up you the potential for problems goes up and we didn't need to do that to run it at those levels to set the records or to make the power to set the records that i, that I knew that we were going to set that being said, I wanted it tuned up there um, just in case. And we would run it and I would run it at, you know, let's say I was running 20 pounds of boost at 20 degrees of timing, which is okay because we have race gas in it and we also have ice water. So we have charge temperatures that might be 50 or 60 degrees under full boost while we're running down the track, which is just the motor just loves it. And so we'll tune it up there and I'll run it at 20 degrees. And when we run it out of the track, I'll probably run it at 16 or 17, just so that it will be safe and won't hurt anything, especially on the first passes. If we run the first passes and it goes into impound and it has set a record and then we back the record up, then that's when you could step things up. Okay, now I'd really like to run this thing. It, it'd be cool to go out and run it at, I wish that I could have run it at 20 degrees and 20 pounds. Just, I wanted to see how fast the car would go. Yeah, the aftermarket iron blocks are heavy, but they're needed for the kind of power level that guys are running on aftermarket iron blocks. I heard once somewhere that the torque and horsepower cross at 5353. Well, they're off by <laughs> 101, 101, like a, yeah, that's right. 101 RPM. They're at 5252. If you set a fuel pressure regulator 
inside the boosted carb box <coughs> with a carburetor when it's pressurized, it will regulate compared to boost pressure. That's an interesting thing, Kurt. I, I've never thought of that. We always have our um, we always have our regulator outside, and then we run a boost reference to it. But I guess if the regulator was inside the box, did you notice it was easier to get more boost at Bonneville? Uh, no, I didn't notice that. I noticed that it makes a lot less power at Bonneville. No, I don't shave my head every day. I, I should, though. But it's just, you know, sometimes you don't want to do that. Two more minutes. Looking at the old time clock. The 5252 is a theoretical number for a 100% thermally efficient engine. No, that's not. <laughs> it's just math. Uh, does quench change timing? I think quench would because it, it would affect the chamber shape, right? Yeah, it would. Uh, how fast can delayed timing heat of the EGTs? Pretty fast. If you if you run um, a a back to back dyno test and you have thirty degrees in one and you have fifteen in the other, you're going to see a big change in timing in EGTs. How much power do you think a stock motorhome 440 with forged internals and a girdle can handle? I don't know. I I don't have any 440 experience. I've only ever run one. Did you get any numbers with the 250? The 250 blower, I did a bunch of testing with it. I, I don't think I've ever put those up because I don't know if I had the photos for it, but I do have all the dyno data. Yeah, the the explanation for why they cross is because it's a mathematical equation. It can't cross anywhere else. Go for the three day shadow. What I want to do though is I, I want to. Um, I was thinking about maybe a tattoo on my head, maybe a bullseye or you know something cool. Or a or, or a globe <laughs> would be awesome. Uh, have you done a big bang on aluminum five three? No, I haven't. I don't think it'd be any different than the big bang that we did on the iron one. Um, I, and I think either redoing either one of those would re, would show a much bigger number now. Uh, the aluminum, aluminum block 5.3, like the L33 or the LC9, <clears throat> those will make the same power that my iron block will. Maybe more. Yeah, the Avatar. <laughs> yep, that would be good. Yep, horsepower does equal torque time RPM or 52.52. <coughs> Dan, if you lower the timing enough, the headers will glow at idle. I, I have seen that. We saw that on a, a five liter that I did. We put a brand new motor together and started it up and the timing was off and they were glowing. I thought, wow, this, there's not even a load or anything on this thing.
Does piston coating change timing? No, I don't think so. Uh, you have a large journal 327. I can't remember now. Is that that's the same as the 350 block, right? Is that what the 350 block is? If it is, then it's just a 350 block, and you could put an, a different 350 assembly in there. You need to put the the rod length should be the same. I think that the pin height in the 327 piston is different because when we did those, I think we used the same rods on all of them. I think we used five seven rods and six zero rods on all of them. So you could make it a three a 350 by putting the 348 stroke crank in it. I want to see the flip piston 360. Um, that video should be out. The I think that already came out for engine masters and I have that motor in my garage. They're running nitromethane. And only on delayed timing for about three seconds could you affect EGTs? Well, you would for those three seconds, right? And I don't—I honestly don't know anything about nitromethane, so I've never tested it. Smash girl twin turbos on the side and M90 on top, nice. How much lower timing on methanol than pump gas are the same? Methanol might require more timing. Eight percent of the car's friction at freeway speed is because of the piston rings. Wow. That's why in the um, Dan, that's interesting. I didn't think it was that much. That's but that's why the um, which one is it? The Metro XFI, I think, has a two ring piston in it because they were trying to get uh, maximum fuel mileage. I think that I think that that's the case. I think I remember reading that. Uh, Engine Masters is not a magazine anymore. Forger Hybrid Technic on low boost Street 57. Either one of them will work. Winner of the slant six and 292 come back. You get to be the last question because I've got to get going. Thank you all for showing up. I don't know. The slant six and 292 both need to be put back together. They're both ready to go. I think the heads have been done on both of them. So they're both ready to test and, and at least run some more things on them. Um, so I could be able to run those. I'm going to go down south and probably put together the Cadillac and the Ford, I think, will be the next two. Um, and we'll see if the Dodge gets put back together in time to go down with me and, and maybe make some runs on that. Colin, thank you very much. Yeah, the 327, 350, I have some videos up on that. Um, and, and you'll be much happier, especially if it's a street car with a 350, because take a look at the video that I have up comparing the 302 and the 327 and the 350. The 350 has a lot more average power and, and for like a street car, all the extra torque will definitely be beneficial. Thank you again from Australia, <laughs> Australia in the house. Okay, guys, thank you all for showing up. Make sure if you haven't seen it already, go check out the video on the timing so you guys learn all about timing. You know, everything that there is to know about timing or at least everything that I know, which is obviously not very much. Thanks, guys. I'll see you all tomorrow.